all these things we do for Eric just to accommodate him. I tell you, it's, it's oppressive really at neat. times. What was that? He's really needy. Yeah, he is needy. So, but you know, hey, what can you do? But anyway, but hey, good morning. So it's uh, uh, glad to get this class uh, started. And I did uh, did miss uh, uh, seeing you all last week, but um, hope uh, I uh, I know uh, I I do feel bad. Brandon told me he's like, yeah, it was almost a hostage situation by the end of it. So uh, he told me he went uh, a little long. So anyway, but that's. I appreciate you all hanging in there. So maybe I should let you out early today, you know, just to compensate for the, for the time there, but uh, appreciate you hanging in there and, and all that. But uh, um, well, let's get started uh, here today and uh, we'll pray and uh, get going. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we do uh, just thank you for another opportunity to uh, be uh, together to uh, discuss uh, your word and, and ministry and just how we can try to effectively reach uh, young people. And uh, Father, I do thank you for each one that is here and uh, just pray your blessing on them, their ministry, their life, their family, and uh, just use us for your glory, God. Uh, and again, just uh, pray you'll make the most of this time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, today... <clears throat> I want to focus on discipling students, discipling students. Now, when you have been in ministry for a few years, uh, inevitably, you're going to have a person, a uh, student or adult, uh, someone in, in your church, in your ministry, who at one time, they're just on fire for Jesus. I mean, they're just pumped up, engaged, ready to go, serving Jesus, you know, doing a lot of things, uh, making a big impact. But then for various reasons, they will either burn out or drift away. Um, different seasons come along. I, uh, I know that with the pandemic, uh, a lot of places have experienced this, that people who were very involved before, um, some, I, I think most have probably come back, but I do know you hear from some people that there are families or people that um, have not re-engaged uh, at the level they were before uh, COVID. Um, but but even before COVID, there were just times that I, I had, you know, you had different people, uh, you know, willing to teach, volunteer, serve, whatever they could do. But then after a while, they just, like I said, they either burned out or drifted away. And, and that was always some of the most difficult, painful experiences that, that I had in, in ministry because, you know, you start to ask yourself, well, what could I have done differently? Or, you know, how could I have, you know, connected with them or reached out to them or discipled them more effectively so that they would stay committed for the long run? You know, uh, what areas could I have focused on to help them stay faithful? Uh, to the Lord. Now, <clears throat> part of the answer to this is in the parable of the soils that Jesus told in Matthew 13. Uh, in, in Matthew 13, and I just want to read these verses, uh, starting verse 18. Uh, you know, I, I love I love this parable because this is one of the few parables where Jesus actually explains the meaning. Um, and it's because the disciples came to him and like, hey, we don't understand. What does this mean? And so Jesus says, listen to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the, 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 <clears throat> the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. 
This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. Now, obviously, there's there's a lot of applications that we can make from this parable here. But, but one of the things that I want us to see is just in ministry, you know, if there's four types of soil, then 25% of the people you teach, according to Jesus in this parable, are going to respond favorably and stay faithful. Okay. Now, I, I get, I know there's always some other circumstances, stuff, but just generality here, Jesus is saying, as you're doing ministry and as you're trying to teach about the kingdom, you're sharing the good news of Jesus, sharing the word. Um, yeah, there's 25% are going to respond favorably and, and be faithful. And, and yet, we, we can use that text and, and that can help us to feel better in some ways. But I think there can be more with the issue of discipleship than, than just saying, well, okay, 25%, that's a good number. All right. But, but I know for me, and, and I'm sure for you all too, that, you know, you're, you're here because you care about people. You love the Lord, you care about people and, and you want to see people be faithful to the Lord, uh, committed to the Lord, devoted uh, to the Lord. I, I preached on Acts 2.42 this past week, so devoted has been in, in my mind a lot. You know, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of the bread, and prayers. And so we want that for uh, the people we're, we're working with, that we're serving with. And and so discipleship is a huge issue, a huge part of this um, keeping people connected to Jesus. And so when you think about your life, how were you discipled? How were you brought to faith? Oh, did, did, was it someone individually that worked with you or your family or, you know, a friend or, you know, I don't, I'm just trying to, in your life, you think about what has brought you to this point? Who, who was the influence that, that brought you here? And um, if, if you'd want to share you know, uh, it, how you were discipled or being discipled, uh, please feel free to, to jump in here at, at any point. Um, I know Eric needs to hear this, you know, as far as um, being discipled and, and all that stuff. So, um, but, but when we think about discipleship, um, you know, a definite, how would you define discipleship? And this could be based off your experience, uh, what you've had, but just curious, open it up here for a moment. Um, how would you define discipleship? Um, let's see. Um. I mean, I would say I don't know. My brain is not working this morning. Um, I mean, teaching people how to follow Jesus. Essentially, I mean, that's yeah, that's yeah, else. yeah, yeah. I wasn't trying to overcomplicate this, but uh, I was just curious, you know, opening it up a little bit here. But yeah, I, I think that's actually a great way of approaching it. Um, when when you look at the, the Greek word for disciple is, is makates. And, and that simply means a student, you know. And so when you think about Jesus's style, and this was often a common practice in, in that culture with rabbis and different teachers, was the students would follow the, the teacher, the rabbi. And they would kind of teach on the go. And that's why a lot of Jesus' uh, parables and his teaching are like, you know, consider the birds. And I'm sure there might have been, you know, some uh, like a flock of birds that just flew by or something like that. Or, you know, look at look at this vine, you know, I'm the vine, you know. Uh, there could have been things like that, that as they were going, uh, Jesus was teaching. And so when you think about the Greek word mathetes, 
is a student, a learner, a follower. Uh, so discipleship is really helping people become more like their teacher, like, like Jesus. And of course, the mission of the church, the, our mission as followers of Jesus is to go and make disciples of Jesus who then also go and make disciples of Jesus Christ. That's, that's the great commission, you know, Matthew 28, <clears throat> excuse me. And so, so that's, that's kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about discipleship is how to teach people, you know, to follow Jesus Christ. And, and, and I always think it's important to remind ourselves of the main thing. Now, the one, the one thing I would say is the ultimate main thing is we're here to bring glory to God. Everything we do is to honor him. You know, it's all about God's glory, God's honor. That's, that's the purpose of our life. Well, in honoring God and bringing glory to God, we do what he has commanded us to do. And that last command that Jesus gave to his disciples before he ascended into heaven was that great commission of go and make disciples. But if you think about it, what better way to glorify God than to get as many people as possible to come with you to heaven? Because in heaven, we're all going to be around the throne glorifying God, praising God. And so to make disciples is just helping get as many people as possible up there to glorify God and, and to bring honor to God in their life. So their life on earth and then in, forever in heaven, um, man, it's all about God's glory. And so, so our mission, though, is to make disciples who will make disciples so we can glorify God together. And, and so that's where it's always important in ministry to make sure we keep this priority of discipleship, keep the main thing, the main thing. Yes, there are a lot of other good things that we can and should do in the church. <clears throat> there are a lot of uh, needs that we want to help meet. But if if the the programs that we do, the the outreaches that we do don't contribute towards discipleship, then we need to reevaluate them and make sure that they're helping us accomplish this primary mission. Um, you know, especially when we're talking about if if we want people to stay faithful for the long haul, to have that um, life that just honors God you know, till the end, that faithfulness to the end, then we know discipleship has to be a priority, that we have to develop habits that lead to spiritual growth. And and so we, we want to stay in those habits of gathering for worship and, and teaching, you know, that Acts 2.42, uh, being devoted to the teaching, to fellowship, the breaking of bread and to prayer. Um, and all. But then, you know, those are kind of the corporate habits that we have as a church. But in our discipleship, we need to make sure that we're helping the people we're discipling to develop these habits uh, in their own life. And, and you know, habits are so there's been so many there's so much research and study out on habits now. I don't know if you've done much reading on habits. Um, there's actually a book called Habits by Charles Duhigg. That's a pretty good read uh, to help you with that. Uh, I know Craig Grishel has several resources on habits and different things. So I, I would encourage you to uh, focus on your habits because uh, I, I think I've talked about this before that, you know, like with your assignments uh, here for class and, you know, I wanted to put them on the calendar to give you, you know, a couple weeks in between each one, but just having that, that discipline, getting into that habit of I'm working on this stuff now, getting it done. So it's not all crammed um, at, at one time. Um, you know, I, I, I say this as an old man now, you know, that, man, I wish I had worked on my habits earlier in life. Um, you know, not that God doesn't redeem, have ways of redeeming our time, but, but man, um, just being that, getting in those habits that lead to, um, just that life that honors God and, and can be effective for him. Uh, so that's where I encourage you, you know, do what you can to, to develop these good habits um, and, and be able to pass that on to, you know, the people that we're teaching and trying to disciple ourselves that, they, that we can all 
develop these good habits. So, so when we think about, you know, helping people become more like Jesus, helping people follow Jesus, what are the habits then that are critical for lifelong spiritual growth? What habits do we need to develop? Now, uh, let me say here, uh, in, introductory, uh, I don't want this, uh, as we go through this, um, I I know each of you are disciples of Jesus, okay? And so don't take this in like a, a condescending way. I'm actually hoping to be able to share something with you that you can share with others as we go through this. So uh, some of this I know is more kind of an elementary level, and so I don't mean it disrespectfully, but it's good to be reminded of the habits that we need as we talk about this, but also I'm hoping that you can use this um, in your ministry to disciple others. Okay. So I just want to kind of say that up front that uh, it's not that I don't think you all know this necessarily, but it, it is a matter of kind of being reminded of what we know and then being able to present it uh, to others. So, so when you think about uh, discipleship, you, you know, the, the first step is follow how do you become a Christian? How do you become a disciple? How do you begin your journey with Jesus? And so you have to deal with that first step. And, and that's something that, you know, you, you can do with, with the people you're trying to reach and disciple. Um, uh, I'm really, really, uh, you know, thankful that I, I got a guy I've been kind of working with here for the last year. And I think, uh, I think this next week, I think he's ready to get baptized and stuff. So, uh, I'm, I'm excited about that, you know, and just seeing, seeing some of that, uh, <clears throat> those light bulb moments where it's kind of all coming together for him, you know, uh, but, uh, so step one is to follow Jesus. You know, they, be, they decide to become a disciple. You know, you go, you teach, you baptize, and then you're still teaching them. Uh, but, but the second step then is what happens after the person decides to follow Jesus. And that's what I want to focus on today. That step two is that grow. You know, what are the habits that we need to develop for this spiritual growth to take place? Uh, and not just for the short term, but uh, for the long term. You know, Ephesians 4.15, where the Apostle Paul writes, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. So once you decide step one to follow Jesus, you are beginning a journey of growth and maturity. That once you're born into God's family, uh, God, you know, he wants his kids to grow up. Uh, just like, you know, when we're born physically, uh, there's a desire for us to grow from babies to toddlers to children to, you know, to teens to, to adults. You know, we want to mature. If if someone's not growing physically, we think, oh, there's something wrong. There's there's an issue here. Uh, my nephew, he uh, he was not growing, so they had they actually had to take him to a children's hospital to get evaluated. And of course, then now he's he's uh, he's 16. He's taller than my brother now. You know, he's healthy and stuff. But when he was younger, they noticed that oh, Kai is not growing the way he should be growing, and so they addressed the issue. When we think about our ministry, our church, you know, are people growing the way they should be growing? Well, that's why we have to discern. Okay, we know that Jesus wants us to grow. We know that's the point of this. So what habits, what what do what what vitamins, what food, what you know, what do we have to do to make sure that we are growing the way that we are going to go? And so I, I think there's there's obviously getting into spiritual disciplines, there's a lot of habits we can talk about. Um, I just want to focus on four basic ones today that um, I think every Christian needs to develop in order to grow to spiritual maturity. And, and, and so we're just going to focus on a few today. But obviously, you can you can do a deep dive into spiritual disciplines and, and all like that with with the people you're trying to disciple. But but it's always good to kind of set it up, uh, you know, by telling people, you know, just imagine that the U.S. Olympic Committee shows up at your doorstep today and says, out of all the people in the United States of America, we believe from studying med medical charts, we believe that you are our best chance to bring home the gold medal in the marathon at the Olympics in Paris. 
all our study, all our scientific progress has led us to your doorstep that you are the best chance for us to run and win the gold in the marathon. You will run the race for us. Now, if they show up on my doorstep and say that, I'm kind of surprised by this because, I mean, the farthest I've run is from the couch to the refrigerator. Uh, you know, so trying to run a ma marathon for a gold medal, that's, you know, but, but hey, if, if it's science, right, we got to trust the science here. So, so I'm the best chance for America to, to win the gold in the marathon. And, and, you know, after I'm kind of like the initial shock wears off, I realize, wait a second, I have an opportunity to represent my country. I have an opportunity to compete with the best athletes in the world, to be around them. I have an opportunity to stand on the podium at the end and, and receive the medal, the prize. And after I think about all that, all the glory, all the sponsorships, all the uh, fame and acclaim that can come my way, then I realize, uh-oh, I have to run in front of people. And not just run in front of people. I have to wear those little shorts that those runners wear, you know. And I'm thinking, oh, boy, this is not good. So what am I going to do between now and next summer? I'm going to start training myself. You know, I'm going to get dedicated because I know I can't run a marathon right now. I, I could try really hard, but 26.2, you know, I whenever I see a sticker on the back of someone's car and it's like 26.2, I'm like, my radio doesn't go that low. I, I don't know what you're listening to there, you know. Um, but anyway, uh, but uh but but even you know if they if that was what happened here you know trying so hard trying hard is only going to get me so far you know but if I go into training I can arrange my life around certain practices that will enable me to do what I can't do now you know even even with willpower even just saying I'm going to do this you know believing in myself and everything like that yeah that trying to run 26 miles not going to happen if I just try. But if I can start training myself in a year, sure, you know, with God's help, I can I could run a marathon. Uh, it is possible, but it's not about trying to run it. It's about training to run it. And, and you can apply this in other areas in life. If, if someone's wanting to play an instrument, um, if you're wanting to learn a new language, if you're trying to run a business, you know, have a startup business. You know, there's training that's required for for any significant challenge or, you know, you know, purpose that you want to take on in your life. And the same is true spiritually, that if we want to grow spiritually, and that's our goal to to grow and be like Christ, you know, we want to be transformed, we want to be more like him, then we have to reset our thinking to be like, okay, I need to to train for this. I need to focus on habits that are going to help me to grow spiritually. And I think so many times what happens in church is we get discouraged because we set out to try to be like Jesus. We don't train ourselves to be like Jesus. We just try. Okay, I'm going to get up this week and I'm going to try to be like Jesus, you know, and it's Monday and man, I've already, you know, said things I shouldn't have said or done things, you know, whatever. I, I'm just, I can't do this and, and see what, so we get discouraged. But if we're training, we know in training, yes, we're going to have some setbacks along the way. There might be some injuries to our body and stuff, but we don't give up. We don't think, oh, I'm just, you know, the worst runner ever, you know, no, we, we keep training ourselves. We use that. And, and we understand that in the process um, you know, the way muscles are formed is actually by tearing, ripping your, your muscles so that they heal back stronger. And so we want to make sure that we're communicating that we're going to train to be like Jesus, not try to be like Jesus. Um, there is a, a difference. And, you know, in the past, whenever I've heard and I've even been guilty of even teaching or sharing messages like this when it comes to following Jesus that, you know, we got to try hard to be like him. 
and, 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 you know, we'd really get, you know, intense. I, I think a lot of times when we go to a camp or a retreat, you know, sometimes we come away like, all right, I'm going to try to be like Jesus. And, and it just doesn't work. That's why, you know, in first Timothy four, seven, Paul told Timothy, train yourself to be godly. Uh, Paul wrote the Corinthian church uh, and, and said in first Corinthians nine, 25, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. And Paul knew, you know, the people there in Corinth, they were familiar with the Olympic Games. Um, they they weren't called the Olympic Games at that time, but they were the predecessor for the Olympic Games. But, but Paul uses that illustration of, you know, if someone's going to compete in a race, they're going to train themselves. They're, they're training to win. And, and, and in our Christian life, we want to train ourselves to win. Um, you know, if, if you, like I said, in other areas of life, if you want to apply it to learning to play an instrument, um, you know, training yourself, learning the scales, learning, you know, chord progression, things like that. Um, you know, people think, well, that's the hard way to do it. No. Trying to get in front of people and play a concert without having practice, with having trained yourself, that's the hard way. That's the embarrassing way, you know. But 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 training yourselves to grow and, and to arrive at that moment prepared, um, I think that's where we need to have our mindset for the Christian life. That following Jesus, I know Jesus wants me to grow. So then what habits am I going to focus on? What habits am I going to train myself so that I can be like Jesus? And so, as I said, I, I think there's four basic habits that uh, are good to when you're working with students. Uh, if they can do these four things, they're going to be on their way. Uh, and then, of course, you can all obviously add other spiritual disciplines uh, in the process. But but I think there's four main habits. Um, your, your daily time with God, serving others, being generous, and fellowship. Now, I'm going to break these down so um, uh, that we can, can listen uh, or focus on them more. But, but let's just start with daily time with God. Uh, and some people call this quiet time. Uh, some people call this devotions. Um, I don't care what you call it. I just, it's important to, to have some time that you spend daily with God. Um, and so when I think about daily time with God, I just know I want to spend time every day uh, with God, uh, reading his word and, and praying. And, and this is something that has to be a habit to help me stay connected to Jesus so that I can grow spiritually. Uh, all my life and, and and this is something that we want to stress with our students that it needs to be a top priority and and there's a few reasons why I would stress this as a top priority there's a reason why I put this this first uh, number one we were created to have fellowship with God you know, we were created to to be in relationship with our Heavenly Father. Uh, in Genesis one twenty seven, the Bible says, so God created man in his own image. There's no other part of creation that is given the privilege that that us human beings have of, of you know, being able to have this relationship with God, the, this fellowship that we can have, the, the communication that we can have. Um, no other part of creation has this privilege. It's what it's what we were created for, you know. Uh, now it wasn't that God was lonely. It wasn't that God needed us, you know. But but God did create us in His image uh, so that we could have fellowship with Him. Then you know, I think in Revelation you go from Genesis to Revelation. In Revelation three twenty, Jesus says, "Look, I'm standing at the door. I'm knocking." If anyone opens the door, I will come in and fellowship with him and he with me. And so that just tells us that God's desire is to have relationship with us, to, to have fellowship with us. You know, he's standing at the door. He's knocking because that's what he wants. That's 
that's why we were created. And so that's why I say, you know, daily time with God, that, that relationship with God, that's got to be the top priority of habit that we develop because that's why we were created. Um, secondly, Jesus died to make that relationship possible. All right. First Corinthians one nine said, God has invited you into this wonderful friendship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, you know, going back to the beginning when Adam and Eve sinned, that fellowship with God was, was broken. When, when sin entered the picture, when sin entered the world, it caused a separation between us and God. And the only way to, to reconcile that you know, with God's love, with God's justice, um, it, it took God sending his son to earth and, and giving his life for that relationship to be restored. <clears throat> and so when you think about the cost involved to make this possible, it's valuable. It's something worth our devotion. It's something worth our time, our effort, our priority. Our priority. And so I want to spend time with God because Jesus had to die to make this relationship possible. Um, the other thing I would say is um, Jesus' source of strength came from his time with God, with his heavenly father. That that he so he could navigate his life, his ministry. Um, he always was seeking time with his heavenly father. In Mark 1, verse 35, and, and then in a couple other places, it tells us that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. And so if Jesus knew that he had a need to spend time with his father, with God, each day, then we know we have that need even more so. Um, uh, and so, you know, if, if we want to be effective in ministry, I, you know, not that it's, that's the, our motivation necessarily. Uh, hopefully our motivation is we love God and want to spend time with him. But, but Jesus's source of strength seems to have flow, flowed from that time he spent alone with God. And so again, in discipleship, we're learning to be like, like Jesus. And so we want to, to, uh, to be like him and, and, and spend that time with our, with our father. Um, a, a fourth thing I would say is when you look at history of Christians who have been effective in serving God, I, I think without fail, they've all had this habit that it was their personal relationship with God that overflowed in their life so that they could disciple others. So they could minister to others. Um, there was a spiritual strength that came and, and it's because they had this daily uh, meeting with God that they read from his word to um, hear from God, to, to learn his will for their life. Uh, they spent time in prayer, communicating with God. And, and I mean, you go back all the way through the Bible, you know, the stories of David, Abraham, Moses, uh, you know, the great, men and women of God, when you study their lives out, you'll see they, they spent time alone with the Lord. And, and that really led to their effectiveness in, in serving him. And, and, and that leads me to say, you cannot be a healthy growing Christian unless you spend time with God. All right. It's, it's just, we've talked about John 15 before about staying connected to the vine that connection is vital uh, to our spiritual life. Um, it's not just a good idea to have daily time with God. It's, it's really a necessity. Uh, you know, when Jesus was facing the temptation uh, from the devil in Matthew 4, 4, he, you know, that first temptation, man cannot live on bread alone, but on every word that God speaks, you know? So physical food is not enough for you to be healthy, you know, holistically. You've also got to have spiritual food, spiritual intake of the word of God. Um, there's a verse in Job, Job 23, 12, where Job says, I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. 
you know, and, and we know Job, his life, his example, he was a right, you know, he, God was like bragging on Job. Have you, have you seen how good, how awesome my servant Job is, you know? And, and again, there's that connection. Job loved God's word. You know, the words that came from God's mouth, more, even more than his own food. You know, that's where his desire was. Now, if you go for a while without physical food, what happens to you? You, know, you, you get sick. You get weak. Um, eventually, if you go long enough without food, you will die of starvation. And so we know physical food is a necessity. Well, the same is true with spiritual food. We need that regular intake of God's word to help us stay healthy, to help us stay, stay strong. Psalm 119, verse 9, asks the question, how can a young man keep his way pure? And the answer is by, by focusing on your word. Psalm 119, 9. And, and so that's kind of the point of our daily time with God is it's a time when we uh, hear from his word, hear his will for our life, and we know this is the way that we should go. And, and so, uh, again, this is just a, an encouragement for you and I that um, if you don't have a quiet time, uh, you're missing out on the privilege that you were created for. Um, you're rejecting the thing that Jesus died to make possible. Um, you know, we're not going to be like Jesus if we don't make this a priority. We're not going to be like the other you know, heroes of the faith, those people from Hebrews 11, that you know they prioritize their their time with God and, and hopefully that motivates us, you know, uh, being gone in Florida last week. Uh, it's, it's so funny how like you get away from some of those things and, uh, you know, not that, not that I was, uh, uh, not reading the Bible at all, but, um, uh, I took a vacation from some things I shouldn't have taken a vacation from, you know, and and it's like uh, this was very helpful for me, you know, working on this lesson for our class today because it was convicting. Like, man, I, you know, I I still did my verse of the day and stuff on vacation, but I didn't prioritize my time like I should have, you know, and and I regret that. Um, but it's been good as far as getting back. But like, you know, um, keep training, make that make that time in God's word a priority you know because because we want to spend time in God's word you know the, the Bible the Bible is the best selling book in the history of the world did you also know the Bible is the most shoplifted book in the history of the world <laughs> which I think is kind of funny you know that the most stolen book is the Bible but but uh, that's just how it, and if they stole it they, they need it you know there you go so anyway um, but you know, when you think about the Bible and you're trying to communicate it to students, <clears throat> help them see that the Bible is actually 66 books. And if the average person were to read the Bible out loud, you know, from Genesis through Revelation, it would take about 70 hours to read. So almost three days just reading out loud, you could read through uh, the Bible. But, you know, when, when students are you know wondering about why should they read the Bible? Well, think about the topics that the Bible addresses. Um, marriage, divorce, adultery, sex, lust, greed, guilt, materialism, generosity, healing, hope, forgiveness, parenting, prayer, friendship, pride, obedience, heaven, hell, lying, murder, suicide, rape, fears, doubt, miracles, love, hate, money, criticism, creation, government, submission, rebellion, peace, leadership, comparisons, joy, discontentment, sacrifice, delayed gratifications, patience, faithfulness, enjoying life, self-control, disasters, injustices, demons, angels, discipleship, disciplines, fasting, honor, mercy, caring for the poor, handling money, and, and your family. And, and that's just like a few of the topics that might be interesting to people to know what's God's will on that. What should I do about that? And, and so that's why I always want to communicate to people, we believe the Bible is God's word. It is the foundation for our life. Everything we do or everything we don't do is based upon this book. Uh, I love the words that Paul shared with Timothy in, in, in 2 Timothy 3, 
where, you know, Paul's like, I want you spending time in God's word. And he practiced this in his life. Again, this is discipleship taking place because Paul told Timothy, you, however, you know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kind of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. That's why it's so important to disciple people and teach them that following Jesus, while it's a blessed journey, it does have its obstacles. There are things that get in the way. And, and you don't want people you're discipling to be just surprised by that when they face those tough times. Because, you know, some people think, oh, I come to Jesus, everything's going to be amazing. Everything's going to be better. You know, all this stuff. And yet, Paul said there in verse 12, if you want to live a godly life, you're going to face some persecution. You're going to face challenges. And that's where going back to that parable of the soils in Matthew 13. You know, people who heard the message and they got excited about it at first, but then when trouble came their way or distractions from the world, they drifted away from, from the kingdom. And so in discipling others, we say, wait, wait you got to expect this. You know, you know the teaching I'm sharing with you. You know my way of life. That if we're truly discipling people, they're, they're with us. And when we're walking through uh, our stuff, you know, that we're dealing with and because there's always going to be things that, that you deal with. Um, we have an enemy who attacks. And um, I, I think I shared with you guys that, you know, we've had some, some things happening in our church this, these past couple months. And, um, you know, we've had about, uh, about 15 people leave our church now, uh, you know, just nothing doctrinal, but just upset, you know, preference stuff. But it, it does take a toll on you. You know, it, it's a painful situation. And, and especially when things are being said. And, and again, you have to remind yourself, this is just the way the devil operates, that our enemy is not flesh and blood. Our enemy is not the people that are, you know, critical. Even some are even lying about some things, um, twisting things out of context. But, but like Paul said, you know all about those things that happened to me when I was in Antioch or Iconium or Lystra. And, and yet the Lord brings us through it all. You know, there's going to be tough times that we face in ministry, but this is where that daily time with God, spending time in God's word is so critical that we can help navigate uh, these situations when, when they come up. And that's why in verse 14 there, Paul said, but as for you, Continue in what you have learned and become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Again, there's that Paul reemphasizing, Timothy, stay connected, spend time in God's word. You, you know why? Because all scripture is God-breathed. God is the source. It's useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And I think I've shared this with you before, but just, just to remind ourselves, notice what the word does. It teaches us. It shows us, here's the path to life. It rebukes us. Hey, you're off the path to life. So it corrects us. Here's how you get back on the path to life. And then it trains us, which is kind of what we're talking about today. Here's how you stay on the path. So it teaches us, here's the path to life. It rebukes us. You're off the path. It corrects us. Here's how you get back on the path. It trains us. Here's how you stay on the path. Do you see why it's so important to spend time in God's word? Because we need that every day. We, we need to know how, okay, here's how I stay on the path to life. And, you know, how else am I going to know the way to life? There, you know, Proverbs 14 teaches us that there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to, to death. You know, it's, it's God's way that leads us to life. And so I just want to, you know, encourage us, stop trying to be like Jesus and begin training to be like Jesus, uh, listening to what he has to say to us through his word. And 
you know, the awesome thing about that is that we not only get to listen, we, we get to speak to God and, and prayer, spending time in prayer is that element. But before we get there, let's go ahead and take our 10 minute break. All right. And so let me uh, stop the recording here. Um, if I can, and then we will meet back in just a few, few minutes. So, alrighty, let me get the share here back. Okay, <clears throat> so sorry about that. I had to. My wife and daughter both have colds, and so I think I'm starting to, I'm starting to feel it coming on to me. So, don't need that it's, right it's, now. It's that time of the year. I think yeah. this is going to start coming around again. That's right. That's right. So, all righty. Well, <clears throat> you know, as we focus on these habits for our lifelong spiritual growth, you know, daily time with God, spending time in His Word is crucial. And then spending time in prayer is also critical. Romans 12, 12 says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. But I think if we're honest, uh, for a lot of us, our, our prayer life is uh, not where we would like it to be. Uh, in fact, sometimes it's something we even try to avoid, you know, because I just think different things we're facing. And so, you know, I, I think the question is, as we're trying to disciple and trying to help people um, and even help ourselves in our own journey, is how can we bring uh, life to our prayers? Uh, and, no. So, yeah. So, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm talking to my No, no, it's okay. I, I know. It was just funny. So, I'm like, I'm sorry. You know, I'll, I'll stop talking about prayer and just move on here. But uh, anyway. <laughs> Uh, but, but I think, you know, a, a good way to help us revitalize our prayers is just taking Jesus's words about prayer and, and really trying to apply them in our life. You know, in, in Matthew six, you know, Jesus said, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received the reward in full. And just being real, I know there's been times at church I felt like such a hypocrite praying, you know, that I'm just doing this because I'm up here in front of people and it's my job and stuff like that. But <clears throat> if we want to truly have a strong prayer life, I think we need to take Jesus's words here and apply them in a way to where we say, I'm going to be real. In our prayer, we have to be real. You know, we're not trying to impress anyone else. <clears throat> That's what the Pharisees tried to do. They were people who would literally stand on the street corner, raise their hands and, you know, face the sky and just carry on. And, and all it was was a show, a religious show, just trying to impress people how spiritual they were. And that's why Jesus is like, don't be like them. Don't be like the hypocrites. Don't be trying to impress people with your prayers. Um, I mean, I, you know, some of the worst moments are if you're in a group, and the people are praying. I, I was a, a few weeks ago, I was in a small group and like they decided to close the prayer circle. And it's like, okay, you're the preacher. You know, you're supposed to, you've got the red phone. It's right, right beside the throne of God up in heaven, you know, direct access. So this has got to be good. You know, this has got to be some deep theological, profound praying here. That's just like, wow, you know, and, and it's just like, you feel that pressure. Um, and what Jesus is saying is, I don't want prayer to be that way. I want prayer to be real. Um, we are, first of all, we have an incredible privilege to communicate with our Heavenly Father because of what Jesus has done. And, and so we're not worried about impressing other people. We're definitely not worried about impressing God because God knows everything anyway. You know, and, and so don't, don't get caught up worried about my words sounding good or saying the right thing. God already knows my heart. He knows my thoughts. Um, 
and so I think Jesus says, just be real, you know, and, and if we can be real, that, that's a good uh, first step towards um, having life in our, in our prayer life. Uh, the next thing Jesus would say is be relaxed. He, he said there in verse six, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. You know, instead of being worried about what others are thinking or trying to impress people, you be real and then be relaxed. You go someplace where you can be alone, where you can have quiet. Um, you can take a few deep breaths if you need to get rid of distractions, put your phone on focus mode, whatever you need to do, and just be able to concentrate. Because I, I know a lot of times the, the biggest excuses people have for not praying is, I don't have time and I don't have a place to go. Uh, but there, there's a great example that you can use in teaching this. Um, Susanna Wesley. Uh, have you heard of John Wesley or Charles Wesley back in the 1700s? So that was their mother, Susanna Wesley. She had 19 children. 19. All right. So if anyone had an excuse for not having time to pray... It would be Susanna Wesley. But they said what she would do, she spent an hour every day in prayer. And where does a mom of 19 kids go to escape? Well, she had an apron that she wore during the day. And when it was her prayer time, she just pulled the apron up over her head. And her kids knew, don't bother her when she's got her apron on her head. She is praying, you know. It wasn't her closet, but it was in her apron, all right? And, I mean, now, if your kids walked into your house and saw you sitting in a chair with an apron on, they're going to think you've lost it. You know, you're crazy or whatever. <laughs> but but I just think it's a great story, a great illustration for people to say, hey, you know, yeah, I mean, Jesus, I go in your closet. You find a place, you know, where where you can just focus and and pray every day and, and be relaxed that it's just it's just you and God. You know, uh, I, I think a third thing Jesus would say is be revealing. Uh, he said in verse seven and eight, when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. You know, when you talk to the Lord, just talk. Um, you know, with when my wife, Amanda, comes in to ask me for something she doesn't come to me and kneel down and say oh thou most honored of men uh, bless me with the financial resources to go and purchase groceries for the sustenance of our family now amanda's just like give me the credit card i'm going to the store you know <laughs> it's like uh it's she just revealed here's what i need you know uh when we come to God, I think Jesus is saying the same thing. Don't try to use fancy words. Don't keep on babbling. Um, just tell him what's on your heart because he already knows what's on your heart. Um, but but spend that time with him in prayer. Be real. Be relaxed. Be revealing. And I think if we can apply some of these words from Jesus, uh, that can help us uh, in, in trying to teach others, hey, just in your prayer, uh, this is how we can do. But but that daily time of God listening to his word and then being able to communicate back with him, that's huge. Those are huge habits that help us to keep growing. Another important habit is serving others. Serving others. The more we become like Jesus, there should be a natural progression that as we grow and mature, um, we will serve others. You know, Jesus himself said in Matthew 20, verse 28, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And of course, Jesus, his role was also to give his life as a ransom for many. Well, that just should translate that as we become more like Jesus, then we're going to be serving others. And when you think about Jesus serving others, the motivation Jesus had was love and compassion. He loved people. He had compassion on people. Um, 
you know, when he saw the crowds, he he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. And and so he was moved to, even though he might've been exhausted, uh, he still served. And, and so that brings us to ask the question, you know, what is my motivation? Why, why am I serving? Why are you at Louisville Bible College taking this class or the other classes that you're taking? Are you here to, to serve or to be served? I didn't see what that was, Crystal. <laughs> you held something up. <laughs> but uh, No, I, I take pictures of all the... Uh, oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, and then I go back and print them out and put them in my notes. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing a lot yeah. of writing. I just take pictures. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I just saw that out of the corner of my eye and I thought, oh, I thought you were holding up something. To, but, uh, but, but it is an important question to ask is, what is my motivation in serving others? You know, and, am I in ministry? Am I doing this to be, you know, man, I, I'm just so thankful for what God has done for me and I just love people and want to serve them? Or, you know, am I more of a consumer that it's about what I get out of this and, and, or it's just a, a job, you know? Um, we want to, as we get closer to, to Jesus, you know, and serving others, um, consider our motivation. You know, because hopefully as we're growing closer to Christ, then we are serving others. But but what is our motivation? You know, um, when we think about the church, uh, you've heard it probably before compared to a, a ship. Um, do you view the church as a cruise ship where everything's geared towards your enjoyment? Or is it a battleship where it's all hands on deck and everyone's serving together? Um, important question, especially as you're trying to disciple uh, others is what is my motivation and and so that's an important question to ask what is my motivation do i see people do i see things the way jesus does or am i just checking something off my to-do list but and trying to understand um how and, and why we serve you know motivation obviously is key but sometimes we also need to ask another question uh, to know where to serve, and that is by asking, what is the need in front of me? Uh, I think sometimes in church world, we get so, you know, overwhelmed at times. There's so many needs. There's so many things we'd like to help with. There's so many things we'd like to do, so many programs. And yet, oftentimes, we just need to ask, what's the need right in front of me? You know, what's what's going on uh, in my neighborhood, uh, our schools, with our kids, you know, what's the need right here? Um, I throw this out too. What makes you smile? Because I think far too often we think serving the Lord has to be miserable. <laughs> like, like if I'm going to serve the Lord, it's just going to be the most awful thing I've ever been a part of in my life, you know? And that's such upside down thinking because yes, there will be challenges. Yes, there can be persecution. Yes, there can be obstacles. But man, when you're in that sweet spot, uh, especially when you're using the gifts that God has given you, um, there's just not much better uh, in this world than, than serving, you know. And, and so, so sometimes I, I, I like to just ask, you know, what makes you smile? Because if God has gifted you and wired you in certain ways, there's going to be things you enjoy. You know, um, I, I'm not the most uh, organized person. I, I have over the years become more organized, but I've always tried to find people in the church who had that gift of administration and, you know, tasks that would drive me crazy. Uh, I just call them up and say, Hey, here's what I need. And man, they love it, you know, because um, they're like Monica on friends, that old TV show. Um, this love to clean and organize stuff and, and they're just freaks of nature. And, you know, Josh, you probably don't even know what friends is, do you? Um, it's, yeah, I know a little bit about it. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm old enough. I can remember when friends was only on TV one night a week. Um, so anyway, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's going back a few years, but anyway, but, but I think it is important to ask what makes you smile. Because that can be an indicator of where God's calling you to serve. Now, there's a couple other questions 
of what angers you that there are some things that when we see injustice taking place, there are things that we should be angered by. And if you become aware of a situation and you feel maybe that's God calling you to say, Hey, I've got you here to do something about this, to help make a difference. Uh, another thing is what makes you sad? Um, because sometimes, you know, when I think about Nehemiah and, you know, of course he's known for going back to Jerusalem and rebuilding the wall, but when he got the message serving as the cupbearer to the king and he got the message that the wall was still destroyed in Jerusalem, it broke his heart. And Nehemiah prayed about it for four months before he asked to go. But, but I think in our serving for others, you know, first of all, I'll start with motivation. Why am I doing this? Uh, secondly, you know, don't get overwhelmed by, yes, there are starving children and, the jungles of South America or a different place like that. And and maybe that's where God is calling you to go. I'm not saying it's not, but oftentimes God wants us to begin by asking what's right in front of me, you know, and uh, you know, the, the, the common phrase now that a lot of churches have adopted is do for one, what you wish you could do for everyone. You know, I, I can't solve world hunger. I, I, it's just humanly impossible for me to feed a few billion people, but I can help my neighbor across the street who needs food, you know? So what's the need in front of me? Um, and then, like I said, those other questions are good to ask too, that the joy of the Lord is our strength. So what makes you smile? And, um, ask those questions to help you kind of determine and discern, Hey, here's where God may be calling me uh, to make a difference, but spending that daily time with God, it, it, Bible reading and prayer is obviously an important priority, but it also flows into serving that we know whatever we do for the least of these, we're doing for Jesus. We know we are in the hands and feet of Jesus to serve. And so serving is just as important a habit to develop, uh, because that actually shows our progress and in, in becoming more uh, like Jesus Christ. So, so make sure we we stress and teach the the habit of serving others, uh, along with serving others, being generous, um, being willing to give. And I know there's a tendency to think, oh, okay, churches are just about the money, you know, and they that's all they want, but. We know God doesn't need your money. Um, God's the one that gave us the money in the first place. So, uh, you know, Deuteronomy 8, 18, but remember the Lord, your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Uh, and there's an important principle here. God will never expect you to give anything he hasn't given you first. When you just think I can't give anymore, then... Well, God's not going to ask you to give anything he hasn't given you first. And and just as God designed us to be connected to one another in the church, God has designed us to be generous uh, with our blessings. You know, we're blessed to be a, a blessing. Um, I, I love to focus on 1 Timothy 6 uh, just because there's so many key uh, principles and, and ideas here. Um but, you know, Paul said, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So in these verses, you know, we're given a formula uh, on really how to be rich. Um, you know, God provides everything for our enjoyment. That's a great thing to teach on, that what God has blessed you with is for enjoyment. So if we're using our resources in, in ways that honor God, there is a satisfaction. There is an enjoyment that should come from that. Um, but he's also given us those things that we can be generous and we can be willing to share with others, uh, to be rich in good deeds. 
Uh, but again, you know, God's not designed us to be miserable. You know, he created this world for our enjoyment. You know, it's when we don't use things the way God has designed it, that's where we get miserable. Uh, that's where the, the heartache comes in. And so, so again, uh, in our discipleship, it is important to teach, hey, think about why God has blessed you with what he's blessed you with. Um, you know, and, and especially when we want to teach that our hope and our confidence is not in what we have, it's not in our bank account, it's not in the economy, but our hope and confidence is in God. Because when the economy is bad and other things like that, you still have that hope and there's that peace that passes understanding. And that's going to make you distinctive to stand out in this world. And, and that's going to be opportunities for you, uh, you know, to, to be able to share your faith. Again, um, you, you're, you look at Jesus and his life and he never, you know, questioned whether or not his God would take care of him. His father would take care of him. And, and he did everything. He, he shared everything, even given his entire life. And so, um, share with your the people you're discipling to be to be generous, and that's not just financially. I think there can be ways to be generous uh, uh, in good deeds, uh, and and that that's why it kind of flows with serving others. But but you could encourage them to, you know, send a, a message or um, you know a text or whatever it is to a friend and encourage them, or you know send a uh, a thank you note to someone or, or, you know, cook a meal for someone, you know, if there's a family that just had a baby or family just had some surgery or sickness, whatever, you know, send them, send them something, send them something, you know, um, go hang out with someone intentionally to try to encourage them. Um, uh, if you get a new, a new outfit, new clothing, you know, donate an old one to someone or, you know, uh, kind of teaching that sharing uh, idea. Um, if you're at a restaurant, leave a, if you had a nice server, leave the biggest tip you can live, leave, you know, on the table, um, just to be, to be generous. Um, you know, I, I, there's different ways that different things we can do in good deeds and, and all you can come up with a list that's probably better, but, but always remember what Peter said in first Peter two twelve: live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. And for, that's such good advice for life, you know, that you live in such a way that even if people don't like you um, and they may accuse you, but the quality of your life is just going to ultimately still draw people to God and, and, and result in glory to God. And so God wants us to be generous, not just financially, but in good deeds willing to share. And so, um, you know, again, I do think this is an important part of discipleship because ultimately in doing this, this helps us to be being generous, leads us to be enriched in relationships with our Heavenly Father and with one another because we're willing to share. And I think we all like to be around generous people, you know, um, I don't ever think, you know, that guy's so selfish. He's so stingy. I just need to go spend time with him. Yeah, no, that's not what we say, you know. But, man, if there's someone who's encouraging and generous and just, you know, always trying to help others, those are people we want to be around. And, and by the way, in John 13, how did Jesus say the world is going to know we're his disciples? It's by the way we love oh. one another. Yeah. And so part of that – uh, the the old saying is you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. So you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. And and whenever you're teaching on love, um, one of the best, it's not original with me, but one of the best definitions of love, God with love, true love, is thinking the best and doing the best for someone even if it involves a sacrifice, then I'm going to think the best of the other person, consider their situation, and I'm going to do the best for them, even if it involves a sacrifice on my part. That's what I'm going to do. Because the best illustration of this is Jesus. Jesus, God was thinking the best. He knew we had a sin problem. And so 
even though it involved the sacrifice of his son, he he sent his son, he did the best for us so we could have forgiveness, so we could have hope, so we could have life. And when you're teaching on love, it's always great to ask, what's the, and especially when you're setting up, what's what's real love? Real love is thinking the best and doing the best for someone, even if it involves a sacrifice. So what's the opposite of love? Because normally when we think the opposite of love, it's hate, right? But the opposite of real love is not hate. The opposite of real love is selfishness. Because remember our definition, real love is thinking the best and doing the best for someone, even if it involves a sacrifice. If I don't love you, then I'm going to be selfish. Because I'm not going to think the best. I'm not going to do the best for you. I'm going to be focused on myself. But I'm so glad for God so loved the world that he gave. I'm so glad God wasn't selfish. He loved us. So he gave. And so, again, that daily time with God, as we grow to be more like Jesus, you know, reading his word, praying, serving being generous, it, it's all part of that growth, that discipleship, those habits that we want to develop. Um, another habit here is, is fellowship, and that kind of echoes what what I've been uh, kind of sharing. You know, when we know in our ministries, we want students to develop those meaningful relationships, and and discipleship is all about being a meaningful relationship that as you build that trust, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that fellowship, you know, we're all on this journey together. And, and so we need those people in our life that can help us be accountable. Um, we need those people in our life who can encourage us. Uh, we, we need that fellowship. Now, fellowship is koinonia. The Greek word in the New Testament is koinonia. Koinonia and the Greek means to share in common. So if you have biblical New Testament fellowship, it, it's not just the, you know, the modern church's version of fellowship is, all right, we'll make some small talk, maybe have some coffee and donuts, or, you know, bring a casserole dish every fifth Sunday and have a fellowship meal together, and that's fellowship. Well, that's not what the New Testament is. I mean, there's elements of that, don't misunderstand, but the New Testament idea of fellowship was so much deeper that you were committed, you were sharing in common. I mean, we see the church in Jerusalem, they're selling property to help take care of others in need. You know, they're they're doing everything they can because they were just together uh, fellowshipping. And, and, and when you're devoted to something that's bigger than yourselves, um, you know, there's a, there's a, a fellowship, uh, a brotherhood that can develop uh, I've experienced this in, in teams and in sports that when you're committed to a common goal, um, you know, those people that you're, you know, you're the, the old blood, sweat and tears, you know, that you bond together. I didn't serve in the military, but there's that band of brothers mentality that develops that you've gone through a shared experience that people can't put in the words, but you are bonded for life together. And if you've ever been on a mission trip or something like that, some of the best experiences and some of the most unifying experiences for your group come through, um, whether it was a hardship or just those moments that you experienced together on that trip that you're bonded, you know, you're, you're, you're sharing together in common, that koinonia. And, and so, um, our daily time with God should flow into that, that serving and that fellowship that we have with one another. Again, Acts 2.42, they were devoted to the fellowship. And that meant they were willing to share their resources, their very lives uh, with their brothers and sisters in Christ. And so, so as we try to disciple people, uh, we want to make sure that uh, we are helping to, to establish these habits uh, for lifelong spiritual growth. And again, there are more habits you can focus on, but wow, if we can get these few uh, for our students, uh, they're going to be a good ways on the journey. And so, so let me kind of 
wrap all this up, kind of bring it all together um, by by sharing, you know, my, my, my goal is not in discipleship to calculate, okay, here's how many verses you should read per day. Here's how many minutes you should spend in prayer. Here's how many hours a week you should serve. You know, here's how you should be generous. You know, here's how you, you know, fellowship. Uh, just to kind of wrap this up, I, I want to close it out with a thought that spiritual training begins with a decision. You know, going back to that step one to follow. And Jesus, you know, he he would get direct with people to, to follow him. And and of course, now the good news is, is we can follow Jesus. You know, what an incredible opportunity, what an incredible privilege um, that, that Jesus calls us to follow him and that we can look like him. We can act like him. I mean, wow. Um, I, I never thought I could do that, but Jesus thinks I can. And so I'm going to quit trying to be like Jesus and start training myself to be like Jesus. And so as we try to challenge our students, the, the, the people we're working with in our ministry, uh, we want to make sure we are discipling them and challenging them and, and use those words of 1 Timothy 4.12. You don't let people look down on you. Not that you're a punk, not that you're a jerk or anything like that. But, hey, Jesus thinks you can grow to be like him. So let's start training ourselves to be like him. So you're setting the example in your speech, in your conduct, in your love, in your faith, and in, in your purity. And wow, I mean, especially with all the things that young people, the, the different pressures that are available today, um, man, if you have a young person that's setting the example in these areas, they are going to shine. They're going to stand out. They're going to be distinctive, you know. But this is where, you know, I hope that we can in our life and our ministry, you know, first of all, we need to be setting the example in these areas, but <clears throat> let's call these young people to go along with us on this journey and let them know, hey, Jesus thinks you can do this too. He thinks you can set the example in these areas. He, he wants to give you the strength to do that. He wants you to be connected to him so that he can produce fruit in your life and, and, and set the example for others. And so, so how can we try to encourage our students to be disciples? Um, how can we truly disciple students? And there's a first, a few things I want to challenge us with in, in, in thinking about this. And, and some of it's with our attitude, church leadership attitude, people in church. Uh, I know there's some things you have no control over, but these are some things that I would encourage us to focus on. And that is, if we're discipling students, stop treating them as the future church. They're not the church of the future. They're the church today. They're, they're the leaders of the future. But on the other hand, from what I read from 1 Timothy 4, I think there's some areas they can lead now. And, and they can set the example. And so don't have the mentality, oh, they're the future church. No, no, they're, they're the church today. And then as you're working with them, continually communicate ministry messages. Um, second Peter one twelve. I don't think I, no, I didn't put that. Whoops. Um, second Peter one twelve. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. So uh, that's where I say, you know, it's not that I'm trying to be, you know, condescending or don't think you know this, but even Peter said, I want to continually remind you of these things, you know? Uh, and, and a lot of times it's just best. We just need to be reminded of what we know so we can be encouraged to keep living what we know. And so in your teaching and as you're planning out your teaching calendar and things like that or developing your small group or maybe a discipleship, you know, a student that you're trying to disciple one on one or whoever. Um, just look for ways to continually remind them and, and communicate, hey, you know, this is where we want to grow. This is how we need to, to live and be like Jesus, and and then and then teach the students. You're created for ministry. I mean, teach your entire youth group, your, you know, the, the junior church, whatever it is. You know, God created you for ministry. God has given you a, a gift. Ephesians two. You know, God prepared in advance things for you to do. Um, Jesus saved you so you can do ministry. You're called into ministry. You're gifted for ministry. Uh, the Great Commission authorizes you. For ministry you know if you're a disciple of jesus you're authorized to go and make disciples so go you know you are created for ministry 
Um, you're, you're commanded to do this. You're, you're prepared to do this. You're needed to do this. You know, there's, there's a place. God has a, a purpose for you. Uh, and there's a reward for this. You know, not that, the, you know, we, we're talking about our motivations and stuff, but, but man, God does reward those who serve him faithfully. And so teach the students, you're, you're created to do this. You're created to be a disciple. You're created to grow and make others disciples. And so in that process, then help them discover their spiritual gifts. Um, you know, you can teach on Romans 12 um, and then 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 4. Um, there's a lot of different resources out there to, you know, for spiritual gift inventories and try to help, you know, understand areas you serve. But sometimes it can be as simple as those questions we asked earlier. What makes you smile? You know, what makes you mad? What makes you sad? And just saying, okay, how's God calling you to make a difference in that play uh, with that need that's right in front of you? But, but, but yeah, you're right there. You know, you're trying to fan the flames for their spiritual gift and help those students understand, Hey, yeah, you might be a, a young person, but man, God has gifted you and, and you, you challenge them and encourage them um, that you've got an aw awesome privilege and an opportunity here to serve the Lord. And, and of course, along the way, you're, you're keeping in touch with their progress that, you know, don't just send them out, but you're walking with them side by side. You know, that's that's discipleship. You know, they're they're you're, you're together on this journey. Um, you know, Jesus, he he taught his disciples. It, it did come a point he sent them out, but then they came back for evaluation. You know, and, and he kept working with them over and over. And so, um, you know, we want to make sure they are progressing and staying connected with them, uh, and and also recognize. Jesus's definition of uh, leadership. Um, that anyway, Matthew 20, um, he said, you know, the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. Their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And all that to say is, you know, yes, we're doing youth ministry, but raise the bar, raise the expectations. They're not the church of the future, they're the church today. You know, they're called to ministry, they're called to serve the Lord. And so spend time with them, disciple them, help them develop these habits so that they can grow and be more like Jesus. And, and let me just challenge us as leaders in the church. Uh, what habits am I developing to grow? What habits am I following? You know, I want to be able to say like Paul, follow me as I follow Christ. So what habits do I need to focus on? Do I know my spiritual gifts? Um, have I have I done the work of discerning that and had others pour into me so I can know what my spiritual gifts are? And then how can I use those gifts to to help build the the habits and the lives of the students I'm discipling? Um, where am I going to challenge you know the, the the young people I'm working with to serve? Um, you know how for my for our ministry how are we going to design that on ramp so to speak? so that people do have an opportunity uh, to serve uh, and to grow. Um, and, and with that, you got to think through some of the logistics, the non-negotiables when it comes to student leadership. Uh, what areas can students serve? Uh, you know, what are we looking for here? You know, but but uh, thinking through some of those things that we're, we're, we're changing our mindset here that you know, they're not just, it's not just babysitting for kids. It's not just, oh, they're the church, you know, down the road. No, they're the church today. And they're they're called by God to serve and we want to disciple them. Um, you know, we want, we want to be discipled ourselves, but we want to disciple them uh, to follow Jesus. So any thoughts or, or comments with uh, discipling students, things that maybe you've seen been effective or you've experienced personally?
All right. So, I guess I just uh, articulated that so thoroughly and effectively that, you know, it's, it's all good. So, <laughs> anyway, but let, one thing I wanted to say here to kind of wrap it all up is as you go through ministry, something good to do is keep track of the good moments or if someone sends you a card or a note or that that kind of that encouragement box that you just uh, i had a, a box that i just would keep different things in uh, that were significant that were special and you know like i said the last last few months have been challenging uh, with our church but i uh, monday I got this a text message from a, a wife in our congregation, and she said, "Hey Wade, I wanted to share with you something pretty cool that happened last night. After fixing up all the plates I, for supper, I asked who wanted to pray. For the first time ever, Bobby, which is her husband, offered to pray, and the surprise and joy in the kids' eyes was something I will probably always remember." I remember all the tears I cried trying to get him to step foot in a church, and now he's serving and offering to pray. God is so good. I just want to say thank you for being, you know, a good, positive influence in his life. It means the world. And just want you to know that, yes, there's bad things happening, but it's not all bad. God's still using you in your life and your ministry. And so when you get those little reminders, you know, Keep them, treasure them, and, and use them as fuel to say, "All right, we're going to keep discipling." And uh, and and it's it's so cool because last week I challenged our men, you know, just by saying the young people need to see grown men who are devoted to the Lord. And and then you get some of that feedback that okay, they're they're, they're taking it to heart, you know. And so, um, so I was very thankful for that encouragement, you know when you're dealing with you know people who are upset and people who are leaving and all this other junk that hey god's god's not done he's still working he's still moving and and so you keep going so uh discipleship it's like i said when you see people drift away and, and stuff it's it's heartbreaking but on the other hand when you see the other direction where people develop those habits and our, our, you see that growth take place, man. It's, there's nothing better. So, so I I pray that for you in your life, and I pray that for your ministry, that uh, God will use you to be uh, effective in discipling others uh, to to know Jesus and to be like Jesus. So, all right. Anything else we need to to go over before we wrap up today? Uh, yeah, I want to share with you all. Thank you for your prayer. Uh, one of the uh. Youth, one of my youth parents came to me last Sunday and uh, she was just thanking me and just, you know, applying what a good job I've been doing with the youth. And she has stepped up and offered to help me teach. And uh, she said, Don't, hey. because I told her this weekend I'll be going, now next weekend I'll be out of town for a wedding on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, well, Crystal, just let me know. And, and the Sundays, because like I said, when I'm not there, no one else teaches. So, uh, but I just want to thank you all because she said she'll step up and if I ever need her to teach and take over, you know, to help with my class when I'm absent, she will do that. So, yeah, just, that's I great. just thank you. Yeah, I remember he was praying for that. So, thank you, guys. Yeah, well, we'll pray that that can be developed and uh, be a good, uh, good uh, encouragement for your ministry there. So, thank you. Very, very good. So, how's the how's the football season going, Mitch? it's going uh we, our, our seventh grade teams were we just played a game last night we lost uh, our seventh grade we have lost we're one in three and we've all three games we've lost by a combined 14 points oh yeah. so we've just lost a lot of close like we're sure. that close to being four and oh rather than one and three um our eighth grade team struggles, but there's just difference in athletes and things like that. But they're they're improving too, so it's good. Late night last night, but it's, it's going good. All right, all right. And uh, life in West Virginia is treating you okay, there, Josh. 
So. Yeah, it's it's going pretty good up here. You know, just keeping on, keeping on. All right. Well, I do appreciate you all um, getting your assignments in. And uh, I know you got the philosophy of ministry paper coming up here in a couple of weeks. So uh, uh, that'll be good. But anyway, well, let's, uh, let's wrap up with prayer. And uh, I'll uh, actually, Josh, would you care to close us with prayer today? Sure. All right. Almighty God, um, we come to you today thanking you for the many bl many blessings we have, uh, like the time we have today to um, study your word. Um, we thank you for uh, um, all the many, like everything going great. Um, thank you that um, Crystal's getting help um, in her ministry. And uh, we appreciate... Um, um, just filling us, filling our hearts with the desire to um, go out and spread the good news with um, everyone around us. And we we pray that we we keep that fire lit and uh, we, we try to um, get close to you every day. Um, it's in um, Jesus name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. Well, you all have a, a good week. And have a blessed week. Hopefully see you next week, okay?